1984 was an important year for wrestling. I'm not sure why I said that, I just wanted to add more gravitas to the video. However, many do consider January of that year the start of Hulkamania, when of course sports entertainment entered the stratosphere and never stopped exploding. So I thought we should go back to that year and go through every single one up to 2024 and decide what was the best match of that year, or actually, which one you should watch if you do have five, ten minutes to spare. Now, of course, this is going to be a long old chat, so make sure you get your tush, put it in a chair, and brew that coffee. Now, let's all calm down and shave our heads. Now, let's go. Number 40, Hulk Hogan versus The Iron Sheik. So, of course, we do start January 23rd, 1984, when Hulk Hogan stormed into the WWF, and he defeated The Iron Sheik. He became the WWF World Champion. Cheeky Baby knew his assignment as well, which was basically to hold that thing until Hogan was ready to go, which is why he did have his short reign, but it was totally different for Hulk. He got onto that title and he held it for around about 9,222 days. Roman Reigns be dead. It's probably why the Sheik has hated Hogan this entire time, because he didn't know what was going on, especially because he had to ham it up as the heel. But this was all about making Terry Bollea a massive star. That's exactly what the then WWF did. Number 39, Hulk Hogan versus Roddy Piper, which went down at the war to settle the score show. That's right, we could have talked about WrestleMania 1, but firstly, it's not actually called WrestleMania 1. Secondly, enough people have talked about WrestleMania 1. It also went down February 18th, 1985, which meant this was on the lead up to the big show of shows. And this was the event where we had to make sure we got the promotion right. Because WWF was freaking out going, Ooh, if WrestleMania isn't a success, maybe we'll go bankrupt. It also aired on MTV, which was huge in the mid 80s. And of course, it ended in a DQ because Hogan didn't much like losing to Piper and Piper didn't want to lose to anybody. Said so it was a window as to what was going to happen in the future because Paul Orndorff and Bob Orton got involved. And also during this, Cindy Lauper also got smacked in the face. And trust me, once again, back then, Cindy Lauper was a massive star. So there's only one thing for it. She was going to have to go to WrestleMania and get her revenge. Number 38, Hulk Hogan versus Paul Orndorff. 1986 brings us to the big event, because even here, Hulk Hogan and Paul Orndorff were still going at it. Orndorff, through this match as well, decided, you know what, I am the WWF champion, even though he had never earned such a title. And this one also ended in a disqualification because Orndorff's manager was Bobby Heenan and he couldn't help himself. Now, fans massively bought into this storyline because the crowd was huge. But it's also a window into what wrestling in the 1980s was like. Nobody, and I mean literally nobody, wanted to lose cleanly. Number 37, the big Survivor Series match. Now, 1987 WWF struggled a little bit because they peaked so hard with WrestleMania 3, they spent the months after going, what the flub do we do now? We did our biggest match ever, and we haven't got anything else on the plate. That's why Vince McMahon decided to give birth to the Survivor Series. Well, that was part one. And part two, he was desperate to screw over Jim Crockett promotions. And because they were going to run a pay-per-view over Thanksgiving, well, the WWF was going to have to do it too. The thing is, though, it was built around the stipulation of being a 10-man tag elimination match, which sounded awesome. And this one was going to have Team Andre versus Team Hogan. Surprise, surprise, people bought it. Andre the Giant was also victorious here, which meant everyone was like, well, what's going to happen now? And the actual answer was, well, not a lot was going to happen. Hogan was still going to be the man. But you didn't know that in 1987, so you were going to have to watch the show to find out. Number 36, Hulk versus Andre. So look what 1988 brought us to. It's almost like there was actually a plan in place. This remains one of the most watched ever matches on television as well because it did a crazy rating. And while it wasn't as bombastic as what we did at WrestleMania 3, I actually think this match between Andre and Hogan is way better. Andre also got the win here after some proper shenanigans from Virgil and Ten DiBiossi. And as we were going to learn afterwards, Hogan's shoulders weren't even pinned to the mat for the 1-2-3. This was also the time when the Giant then gave up the title to the million dollar man Ted DiBiossi because everybody has a price. When then President Jack Tunney was like, you can't do that. And the title was declared vacant. And man, I tell you, vacant. He's one of some of these things and he barely ever does anything. Number 35, the 1989 Royal Rumble. So this was the first time the Rumble was presented as a big main event, as a pay-per-view. And it must have done something right. Because here we are in 2024 and the damn thing is still going and you're still paying money for it. Big John Studd being the winner was a little bit meh, but it's actually what we learned about the Rumble here that was the best bit. I mean, the story between Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man went into full gear and then Tim Trials started to show us, oh, if you do work together in the Royal Rumble, you're going to have a better chance of winning until you get to that point where you have to screw your partner over, but it's every man for himself. You also had Ted DiBiase just buying the best number because he wanted to have the highest success point of winning. So dare I say it, we had a lot of fun with this Royal Rumble, especially when it came to gimmicks. So maybe that's something we could actually reintroduce 
in 2025. The 34, the Dream Team versus the Million Dollar Team. It is back to the Survivor Series for 1990 because, yes, Ted DiBiase had called out Dusty Rhodes. And who else was on the American Dreams team? It was none other than a very young Bret Hart. The reason, of course, you put this on, though, is because Ted DiBiase had been teasing the whole time, I have a special mystery guest to be my fifth man, which actually turned out to be the debut of the flipping Undertaker. Now, I'm sure you've seen this a thousand times, but it's absolutely worth repeat viewing. You actually go through his entrance and you can see people in the crowd genuinely scared by this. And when it comes to the persona and it comes to the gimmick, this in many ways was the best version of it because it was just so old school, which is not a pun. I mean, the original idea was meant to be he was a cowboy Undertaker. And that's how he dressed here. And it's how I'll always remember it. Number 33, Mr. Perfect versus Bret Hart. At SummerSlam 1991 for the Intercontinental title, this was one of the best matches ever. It's even better when you learn that Kurt Henning actually had a bad back here, but was still bumping his ass off because he had decided it was his job to make the Hitman look like a million bucks. And boy, how did he did he? Bret was also the perfect opponent too because he wanted to make this a masterclass. And it doesn't matter how many times you watch it, this just ages like a fine wine. Hart's win was also going to set him up for a massive future as we know now. So this is something I will go back to time and time again. And I always just enjoy it a little bit more. And never forget, Mr. Perfect was hugely underrated. And one of the top entrants in the who should have been world champion and never got the nod. He should have won that thing at least 72 times. Number 32, Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels. Mostly because we don't talk about it enough. Because this went down way long before their real life feud kicked off. It actually happened on a random show on the 21st of July, 1992. Which is why you have to go out of your way to see it. There's also a ladder match for the Intercontinental title too, which gives it historical reference as well. Because when you do sit down and you lay your eyes on it, you're like, well, this is essentially a template for all the ladder matches, even the ones we know about today. And yeah, that's the influence that Sean and Brett had. It is yet another reason, though, why they do go down as old timers. And honestly, if you've never seen this, but you know about the Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels programs, you have to find time to seek it out. It will totally blow your mind. And don't forget, it was happening in the mid-90s, and yet elements of this still exist today. Number 31, Bret Hart versus Doink and versus Jerry Lawler. From the 1993 SummerSlam, and I'm sure you're going, oh, the clown's in it. This is going to be goofy. Actually, it wasn't. But this is yet another masterclass from Bret Hart, who had just decided, okay, what kind of offense does Doink the Clown have? I better sell that. And this was also the original Doink. So he's got that glint in his eye. And you're like, man, there's something wrong with you. You also had to get through Doink in order to get to Jerry Lawler, who was his arch nemesis at the time, because the king had just walked out and gone, ha ha, Bret, I know you thought you were going to fight me, but I'm injured. So you've got to take on my jester instead. Jack Tunney then told Lawler, given that Bret Hart won, that he did have to get in the ring. And the hitman was so annoyed about this, even though he won the match via sharpshooter, he refused to release the hold, meaning actually ended in a disqualification. This is just so well done though, and actually built to their big match that we're going to have later in the year. And it all happens on the same show. So again, you need to go and sit and watch this one. Because it just proves to you, it doesn't matter who you're facing, you just have to figure out how it can all work. And it will always be two plus two equals four. Number 30, Shawn Michaels and Diesel versus the one, two, three kid of Reza Ramon. So it was October 30th, 1994, when all these buddies got in the ring. And because they were putting their working shoes on, there was no politics between them because they were good friends. My word, they put on a clinic. I do also believe it's the one and only televised match between the clique. And honestly, this has so many creative spots in it. I'm not just saying this for fun. It actually is one of the best WWF matches of that year. Now, once again, of course, you're going with well, that's obvious, Simon, because they are pals. But that is the point. They may have been running roughshod in the locker room. But when they knew it was time to go to work... Well, this is exhibit A. It is really, really good. Number 29, Bret Hart versus Diesel. From the 1995 Survivor Series... I love this match. Because it is yet more proof that Bret Hart is a genius. Because he just looked at Big Sexy and decided, well, you are a very large man. How on earth would I chop you down to my size? So he just worked over the leg like an absolute pro. It's also the third match in a trilogy. So they knew that they had a bar to live up to. And you've actually seen a spot from this match time and time again. Because they do take that bump from the ring apron through the announce table. And while we see that all the time today, back then it was a total revelation. But this is another one that has historical significance. Diesel also beat the absolute hell out of Bret Hart until he had nothing left. And just when it looked like he was going to get knocked out and Diesel was going for the bomb of power, of course, Bret turned it into a devastating move in all of sports entertainment. And he got the one, two, three. This kind of ties into everything else we have been saying. If he did that in 2024, everyone goes, well, I saw that coming a mile off. But back then was quite the inventive finish. Number 28, Bret Hart versus Steve Austin. At the 1996 Survivor Series... 
Now you're starting to see my pattern. Once again, though, is Brett just looking at somebody like Steve Austin and deciding, well, you've got all the skill needed. I'm going to make you into a star. And while these guys do have some terrific matches, this is the one that always gets forgotten. It also helped get the Stone Cold character over, because don't believe all the pomp and circumstance that WWE has sent over the years. It wasn't like Austin cut the 316 promo and all of a sudden was the biggest star on the planet. He had to have matches like this, and it was slow momentum. It was also one of those fights where Hart was able to walk away with the win, but also looked like he escaped with his life. Life. And look, we all know where Bret Hart and Steve Austin was going to go after this. They were going to change the way we looked at wrestling forever. Number 27, the main event of the Canadian Stampede. Now, yes, this match happened in 1997, which is also the year that houses the best match ever, which is Stone Cold and Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13. But I've already told you, we're trying to do a little bit things differently. Because soon after, it was this classic where Austin teamed with Ken Shamrock, Goldust, and the Legion of Doom to take on the Hart family. But because this was coming from the center of Canada and the Hart's hometown, it is an absolute delight to watch. I mean, the floor starts to shake because the audience is making so much noise. It also builds to Owen hitting the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment onto Steve Austin to start their feud as well and take him away from Bret Hart. And again, this is one of those matches that you have to see based on atmosphere alone. It will remind you why you fell in love with wrestling in the first place. Number 26, Dude Love versus Stone Cold. And over the edge, 1998. So once again, we are going for the more surprising choices. The reason this is worth a watch is because Stone Cold Steve Austin had finally become the man. And in this main event, he was totally going to recreate his own template and show WWF the way to do it. Well, essentially till right now. That's why we chose Mick Foley and turned him into Dude Love as well. Everybody knew that Foley was a great brawler and he was a master in this kind of environment. Surprise, surprise, they have a really good match. And yes, look, Mick Foley was never going to win here, but that wasn't the point. We had a completely different mission. And as for Steve Austin, well, he was just so over. Actually, the fans didn't care. They just wanted to see him. They just wanted to hear the glass break. And they just wanted to see him do a bunch of Stone Cold Static. Number 25, Test versus Shane McMahon at SummerSlam 1999 of all things. And there is way better stuff in this 12 month period that you can watch. But actually, Shane McMahon and Test did get into a little bit of a feud. And this match is actually pretty decent. Because one, it is a street fight. And two, they were quite friendly backstage. So they just beat the absolute piss out of each other. Like everybody has always said that Shane O punches are a little bit hard anyway. But here, I'm 99% sure he's just whacking Test right in the face. We don't do anything dumb here either because Test did get the victory. And that would be about six months after this when we properly screwed that guy over with that wedding. We've talked about it on other videos. I don't think we need to talk about it here. Number 24, The Rock versus Triple H. Now this one is hilarious. It went down at Judgment Day 2000. Because Triple H and The Rock decided they were going to use Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels' Iron Man match as inspiration for their one hour long q ha But instead of it going nil-nil, I'm pretty sure this one ends up at five falls to four. It's also filled with weapons, violence, and a bunch of shenanigans from the corporation and Degeneration X. And the reason I'm not sure what the actual final four count was is because it ends with The Undertaker returning in his American Badass gimmick, which we had never seen before. And while the bell does ring when he's whacking people, it is so chaotic, the commentators don't even know, this thing kind of just goes off air. It does make the one hour time limit fly by though, when we get to the last few minutes, and it totally loses its mind. Mind, but I cannot tell a lie. It is super duper fun and in many ways kind of drew a line onto what the Attitude Era was all about. Number 23, Team WWF versus Team Alliance. So the 2001 Survivor Series was built around this idea that it was the World Wrestling Federation defended their honor against WCW and ECW. But by this time, most fans had sat back and looked at this card and gone, <laughs> most people affiliated with this match were also just WWF guys. Because it was really only Rob Van Dam and Booker T that felt like outsiders, but they had been on TV week after week, so that novelty had worn off. And do you know what the main takeaway of this is meant to be? Stone Cold versus The Rock? I mean, obviously. Kurt Angle also got a huge boost here because he went babyface after turning on Team Alliance to allow Team WWF to win. But we were going to put such a full stop on this that within weeks he was back with Vince McMahon and he was playing the heel. That just sums up the invasion storyline in many ways. It certainly had some high points, but a lot of it, well, it's pretty, pretty rubbish. Number 22, Rey Mysterio versus Kurt Angle. Now, SummerSlam 2002 is good from top to bottom, one of the best pay-per-views ever, but we do not talk about this opener enough 
because it's absolutely brilliant. Because you really did have two of the best wrestlers in the world at the time setting the tone for the entire show. And while most people had realized that, oh my gosh, Rey Mysterio is a proper game changer because it had been going from like 1996, this in many ways was Kurt's coming out party where you all knew that he was smashing it, but my word, I don't think we knew he was capable of this. I mean, given the fact that it doesn't even go 10 minutes, surely this is one of the best sub 10 minute matches ever. It is just go, 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 fire, fire, fire. And if I had been a wrestler in that locker room, I'd have been watching it going, Somebody cancel my match. I can't follow that. That was absolutely ludicrous. Number 21, Team Austin versus Team Bischoff. At the 2003 Survivor Series, and yes, this is kind of silly, silly stuff. Because the year in general was particularly hard as WWF tried to find a new direction, hence why they kept leaning on Eric Bischoff and Steve Austin. And while these two were having a lot of fun backstage, as we did know, they were never going to fight in the ring properly. They weren't allowed. The build for this thing was all over the place too, but when we actually got to the pay-per-view, things got really serious, especially when it came to Shawn Michaels. It just felt like he'd been thrown into this, but of course, it was just when he had accepted, oh my gosh, I am going to get a second run, and he is clearly so happy this had come around, my word, he bumps his ass off. The ending is mad too, because Steve and Eric start fighting in the aisle. When Batista rats out, he interferes, allowing Randy Orton to look at Sean and give him the RKO and get the win. Plus, there was more consequences here too, because it meant that Stone Cold Steve Austin was no longer the general manager of Raw. So once again, this was just fun when we did get to the belly of the beast. It's everything before it on Raw that was a little bit rubbish, but thankfully you don't have to watch that and you can just watch this pay-per-view instead. Number 20, Mick Foley versus Randy Orton. And speaking of Randy Orton, when 2004 rolled around, he was desperate to sell himself as a credible main eventer, but nobody was buying that he was all that tough, so somebody called Mick Foley. Going down a back glass, this is the street fight that many people have talked about, but Mick goes out of his way here to get the job done, and my word, by the time he grabs Randy and throws him into the thumbtacks, you had millions of people going, oh, I didn't think the Viper had it in him, but I guess I was wrong. It's gonna serve Randy Orton for his entire career as well because he's always stayed away from these spots and picked them when they did make sense. And when it came to old Cactus Jack, I tell you, nobody was as good as him as giving other wrestlers integrity and credibility. Thankfully, too, Foley got something out of this because at the time he was like, man, I haven't had that one last final great match. And this absolutely was it because it happened way over 20 years ago. Like I've said a few times, even if you sit down and watch it in 2024, it's still one of the best street fights you could ever hope to see. And Randy Orton wins. Who would have thunk it? For 19, Triple H versus Batista. Now, most of 2005 was actually Triple H giving the star treatment to Batista, but that's why I want to talk about the Vengeance match, because it's another one that goes under the radar. Because while WrestleMania 21 had probably established Big Dave and told everyone he is one of our new stars, he still needed a little something else, which is why this thing went down in a hell in a cell, and it's absolutely brutal. So while Triple H takes a beating, Batista did too, so it's the same thing we just talked about Randy Orton, and by the time he is ready to give the bomber power to the game, who grabs a sledgehammer, you think that Dave is going to get hit in the head. He does not. He hits his big move. He gets the 1-2-3, which also meant his win-loss record against Triple H was 3-0. and oh. And I know you're now shouting at the screen, Simon, Triple H should have done this to other people in the era. Well, you know what? He didn't. But he damn well did it here. Number 18, Kurt Angle versus The Undertaker. So we go all the way back to No Way Out 2006 for this one. And be honest with yourself and be honest with all your friends. You didn't think this one was going to be as good as it was. I shouldn't be waggling my finger. Now, that sounds really mean, but it is true. And I think The Undertaker must have picked up on this as well. Because he decided, man, I'm going to show all of these folk. And Kurt Angle had the talent as well. And this just blew all expectations out the water. The WWE title was also on the line, which actually added to the drama. Because nine times out of ten, the dead man would win but they just trade submission after submission, and they actually put this thing together like it would be a real fight, because of course at the time, everybody loved MMA, as did Kurt Angle, as did The Undertaker, and this is a mini masterpiece. It's also probably the best showcase of Taker's approach to this MMA style that he did become obsessed with, but at the same time, when Angle keeps catching him in the ankle lock, bravo to the real life Mark Calloway, he sells this like he's dying. Now, it's totally mad to think that six months after this, Kurt Angle had left the company, because clearly he had so much more to give, and we were going to get that in TNA, but if you consider yourself a WWE fan, well, this was just really, really upsetting. Number 17, John Cena versus Umaga. This is another forgotten classic, but at the 2007 Royal Rumble, John Cena and Umaga decided we are just going to kill each other. It's why when WWE shows clips or pictures from this, it's usually in black and white because there was so much blood. And this was before John Cena had gone, I'm going to write poopy on a limo. And I tell you, it gave him a real edge to his character. 
the Adam Copeland. It was also a last man standing match, and I tell you, they just toyed with the idea of what PG was meant to be. Some of the shots here will make you go, oh man, I don't want to see. It also got the Umaga character over huge given the finish, because John Cena had to get the ring rope, yes, the thing that goes around the squared circle, and try and kill him with a strangulation move. So surprise, surprise, Umaga wasn't able to get to the count of 10, but everyone was still like, my word, he's totally crazy. John got away with one. Cena is also a bloody mess at the end of this. If you're only familiar with his over-the-top nonsense, this will totally blow your mind. I mean, if you are into violent WWE matches, you should probably start here. Number 16, Chris Jericho versus Shawn Michaels. Now, there are many of these throughout 2008, but we are going for the one from No Mercy. Jericho and Michaels, by this point, had basically already had the feud in the year, and given who was involved, we did decide to do a ladder match, because Shawn was well known for these. In fact, he'd made them famous, and because the story told us that Jericho looked up to the heartbreak kid, well, he wanted a part of it too. It wasn't the absolute car crash we see today either, although it does have elements of that, but it also borrows from a more old school style. And when they are doing a tug of war off of the belt, over the ladder, I tell you this for free, there is some real emotion to it. You also get a damn lion so onto the ladder, so what else do you need? And of course, eventually Lance Cade runs out to stop Shawn Michaels getting the title, which eventually does allow Chris Jericho to win. But at this point, Chris felt like one of the best wrestlers in the world, and he needed moments like this. So all it was going to do was help the WWE overall. And again, it's not all those matches you can watch right now. It doesn't feel out of place at all. Number 15, Rey Mysterio versus Chris Jericho. Now, 2009 is a very weird year for the WWE because if you do want to find anything good, you're going to struggle. But when we get to the Bash pay-per-view and we did do Chris Jericho versus Rey Mysterio, well, this is damn fine. I would say by this point, Jericho could be entrusted to have a good match with anyone. <laughs> Rey Mysterio was Rey Mysterio. I shall go back to what we just talked about. He was a proper all-timer, even in 2009. They also had some real history because both had gone through ECW, WCW, and WW for a long time but never met, which is why we put the Intercontinental title on the line and we put Ray's mask on the line. So whoever lost here was totally boned. Chris totally focused on this phony idea as well, which is why he tried to rip off Ray's mask. And when he did do this, Mysterio had anticipated it because he is a smart baby face. He had another mask on underneath, which is when Mysterio hit the most devastating move in all of sports. Then he took the surprise roll up and he got the three. But once again, this is just so well done. And I get it. Sometimes in 2020 war, we forget why people have become so famous. Well, this is one of those fights that will absolutely remind you. Number 14, the 2010 Royal Rumble match. Mostly because of Shawn Michaels. Because that's right, this is the Royal Rumble where Michaels was so desperate to get one final shot of the Undertaker who was the world champion, he decided he would win the Royal Rumble. And he was so irate by all of this, he even super kicked out his friend Triple H. Oh no. It also meant though that when Batista finally knocked him to the floor and Michael scrappled to get the rope and he failed, that word emotion comes into play again. I wasn't even a massive Shawn Michaels fan at this point, but even my heart went, oh no, he hasn't done it. You also get the surprise return of Edge and CM Punk just yelling at his victims on a microphone. And even though the likes of John Cena and Triple H were the favorites to win this, it is the returning rated R superstar who gets the victory. So this is an absolute hoot of a Raw Rumble. Another thing you should go out of your way to see. Number 13, John Cena versus CM Punk. So not everything on this list is going to be a massive curveball because we have got to 2011. We go to Money in the Bank and one of the most historic matches ever is Punk versus Cena. In the weeks leading up to this too, we'd had the Pipe Bomb promo and the fact that Punk's contract was going to expire, which we did tie in. And in one of the greatest coincidences of all time, this was happening in Chicago. And when CM comes out... Well, there's only one word for it. He is a hometown hero. There's also a story that we should have talked about for years, and for obvious reasons, this was going to go in a different direction. But in terms of watching it on this night, without any of the other context, it just has one of those atmospheres that kills you inside. And when Punk does win the WWE Championship, and he waves goodbye to Vince McMahon, everybody hoped we weren't going to see him for six months in a good way. And then he was back in two weeks. So the fallout of this wasn't great, but the match itself is the complete opposite. And he got five stars in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. I mean, that means nothing, but also kind of goes to show just what a special time it was. Number 12, The Shield versus Ryback and Team Hell No. TLC 2012 is when this went down. And don't worry if you can't remember, I don't even remember this being a thing. When I finally did go back and watch this, it actually blew my mind. It was during a period where The Shield had been told, you are a tree, you are a team, and you don't take no squit from nobody. And because it's fought under tornado rules, they do come together as a group 
and they totally run riot. And yes, once again, this is because Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and Dean Ambrose came together to work as a unit, including grabbing Kane and basically burying him under a bunch of garbage. They wanted him dead. Ryback also gets thrown off a ladder through two tables, and Daniel Bryan gets totally murdered with this power bomb. When you see them standing tall at the end, given what we do do now, they got to the top of the industry. I mean, that was the goal from day one, but they did it with so much skill. And yeah, even though we are talking about 2012, when you get to the end of this, they all look like stars. Number 11, CM Punk versus John Cena. Part two, maybe part five, they did fight a lot. This is the one that went down the 25th of January 2013 Raw though, and also the match where John Cena gets hit with a pile driver, courtesy of CM Punk, and even now I'm like, wait a minute, that move is bad. Given the dates though, I don't think CM Punk cared anymore, and Cena was Cena. Could do whatever the flubby wants. Of course, I think there's an argument to the fact this was their best match because by this point, Punk knew he wasn't going to be in the WrestleMania main event, even though he thought he deserved to, so he had a chip on his shoulder. Although that ties into the stipulation as well, the winner of this was going to be the guy going to the show of shows. The WWE teased it wasn't going to be John Cena versus The Rock. Obviously it was. We do use that though because there's a continual hint that oh, it is going to be a triple threat match in a couple of weeks when eventually Johnny Boy does get the big W. But this is just so well worked. You may have heard CM Punk in interviews go, John Cena was so easy to work with. Well, I think I know the answer to that because these two have fantastic chemistry. Number 10, The Shield versus The Wyatts. I honestly think in terms of modern day triple tag team threat matches, this is right at the very top. Because you go to the 2014 Elimination Chamber and it just is underlined by the fact that these two teams were going to war like the song and they were going to completely steal the show. Bray Wyatt was, of course, trying to get in the Shield's head during this, going, ha, ha, you're not as close as you think you are. And that actually plays into the match because while Seth Rollins looks like he's going to save Dean Ambrose, he's not able to do it. It's the same for Roman as well because he has met with the same fate when all of a sudden you start to think, oh my gosh, the Wyatts are going to do it. When we get into the back and forth wrestling tennis... It's just a delight to watch. The finish is poetic as well, because just as Reigns is about to spear Bray Wyatt, Luke Harper gets in the way, and he takes the bullet for his mentor, when Wyatt is able to hit the sister Abigail onto Roman Reigns and get the one, two, three. And you know how impactful that is. Nobody but nobody beats Roman. That just makes it all the better still, though. Obviously, it hurts watching it back today. Bray Wyatt was taking from us all far too soon. Number nine, Brock Lesnar versus John Cena versus Seth Rollins. So you should have seen this one coming because it did happen at the 2015 Royal Rumble. And again, in terms of modern day triple threat matches, it's right up there. Now, I'm not sure what people's expectations were before this, but it certainly made you start to think because now there were three people in the ring. So you kind of stroked your fake beard and went, huh, maybe Brock's going to lose his title. Rollins was also money in the bank at the time and John Cena was John Cena. By the time the Philadelphia crowd had bought into this, oh my gosh, I tell you, it's a pee. Rollins and Cena also have to work together to bury Brock Lesnar under the announce table when 10 minutes later, he does come back like the beast that he is. But it's just the exchanges and the flurry together of moves. These three worked terrifically well together. So yes, Brock was able to keep hold of his goal, but nobody was disappointed here. I mean, if you are trying to come up with a modern day triple threat match, you should probably go back and look at this one first. Number eight, Team Raw versus Team Smackdown. In 2016, the Survivor Series was well into this whole Team Raw versus Team Smackdown stuff. And while sometimes it was quite embarrassing, this one, well, it actually did all right. And the main reason for this is because SmackDown finally had become its own show and not just something to tune in because you wanted a recap of Raw. So when superstars started saying, hey man, I'm part of the blue brand, you could actually believe it. Now, ignore the fact that the competitors are forced to wear red and blue shirts because that is embarrassing. But you have AJ Styles, Bray Wyatt, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, and Shane McMahon go to war with Kevin Owens, Braun Strowman, Chris Jericho, Roman Reigns, and Seth Rollins for almost an hour. It also meant they were acting like brand supremacy was going to matter. And do you know who gets the win here? It's Bray Wyatt pinning Roman Reigns again. So we were just doing the dance of joy. Maybe we're going to get something different. I mean, we didn't, but we didn't know that then. Don't forget as well, when you are done with this, even if you are a little bit bored after 60 minutes, you also get Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. As I'm sure you can remember, that doesn't go very long at all. So in terms of an end of a pay-per-view, this one is really, really good. Number seven, The New Day versus The Usos. You're scratching your head, right? You're like, when did this happen in 2017? Well, I'll tell you on the pre-show to SummerSlam. That's right. Now, WWE was silly for putting teams like the Usos the New Day here, but you already know what they did. They laughed this off like, oh, you're going to put us on the pre-show, are you? And they went out there 
and they screwed it up for everybody else because they stole the show. They'd already proved this the month prior when they got onto the pay-per-view properly, but as this was the pre-show, they got 20 minutes, and oh my gosh, it's an absolute barn burner. I mean, Jimmy and Jay almost left as baby faces. They were so good here, and it tied into what we were going to do with 2019 and Kofi Mania, because the Usos gave up their spot in order to allow Kofi to bypass them in the Gauntlet, as they said at the time, it's due to our history, man. This is the damn history. They also continued to fight constantly after this and they never had a bad match. And I tell you this in 2024, the New Day and the Usos are two of the best teams ever. If you want to argue with me, you can, but I'll ignore you. Number six, Becky Lynch versus Charlotte Flair. So I hope we get more of these soon because these two as a pair are definitely not done. Now they knew they were going to have to deviate at 2018's Evolution show because everybody was going to have to have something different, which is why they had a last man standing match or a last woman standing match. My word, it just smashed the roof of the place. Becky was also about to become a megastar and Charlotte never has a bad match. And you could almost feel the personal pride here, which I guess is one of the reasons they did have a real life falling out. It became too much. They do not hold back at all though, as they just smash each other with chairs, ladders and tables and anything else they can find when eventually Charlotte Flair goes for a moonsault, but Becky catches her and gives her a power bomb through a piece of wood. Flair wasn't able to make the 10 count and of course Lynch was about to explode because a few months after this, she would be the hottest thing in wrestling. There's nothing on my wrist. Number five, the Graveyard Dogs versus Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre. This kind of sums up why 2019 WWE was so bonkers. This did happen at Extreme Rules, and yes, the Graveyard Dogs were the team of Roman Reigns and The Undertaker. But here's the biggest spin of the modern day. This is absolutely excellent. In fact, it's so good in hindsight, it should have been The Undertaker's last match, although I do not begrudge him holding on at all. Do you know how hard it is to walk away from a career that you've loved and you've done for three decades? The answer is very, very hard. How we pull this off though, I will never understand because yes, it came right in the middle of everyone going, boo, Roman Reigns, we hate you. Whereas Shane McMahon was winding everybody up saying, <laughs> I'm the greatest in the world. And as for Drew McIntyre, where he was completely miscarred. Something clicked though, because we did everything right. And McMahon finally got his for running around, shouting this stupid catchphrase. Whereas the Undertaker was like a man possessed. The irony, I mean, he moved faster than we'd seen in years. It also meant that Reigns could actually play the role of the strong baby face. So surprise, surprise, it did work. Though I will never understand how we pulled this off like we did. It's just so much fun. And it's filled with a bunch of people that in terms of that dark, dank internet community, well, they didn't really like them before AJ Styles versus Brian Danielson. On the June 12th, 2020 Smackdown. So yes, we are going to the pandemic era. Oh no. Now realistically, nothing is actually watchable from this period because it's just so sad to watch. But Daniel Bryan knew that and AJ Styles knew that. So when they had a match for the Intercontinental Championship, they worked it like it was real. They didn't play to the crowd at all. And in terms of offering you something different in your sports entertainment, it's a five-star match. I mean, really when you break it right down, it was essentially AJ doing all the stuff he had done in New Japan, whereas Bryan was finally allowed to be let off the leash and do his preferred style of grappling so you can feel his joy coming from the TV too. So essentially you get an authentic wrestling match at a time where the world totally needed it. Well, I know that the pandemic brings up other conversations, but this is how you'd have to do wrestling if we were never allowed fans in a building again. But trust me, let's always let fans in the building again. Number three, Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte Flair. So you can also watch their WrestleMania 39 match, which is also absolutely stellar. Or you can go back to the 2021 Money in the Bank, where yes, Rhea Ripley also loses, but it was actually a star-making performance. It also means if you watch it today, you don't have to worry about the results. We know what Ripley has gone on to do, and these two just have such good chemistry, and like they would do at the WrestleMania we just talked about, they knock lumps out of each other. I don't know why this happens in wrestling, but when you do do that, I just get invested. The chops sound like gunshot too, and they just sell like death constantly. And do not forget what Rhea Ripley was gonna do after this. She was gonna climb that ladder rung by damn rung to the point she recently got injured. And we all felt like it was the end of the world. I really do think this is gonna be one of those matches and feuds you can go back to whenever the hell you want, because these two are like Batman and the Joker. They're always gonna be together. Number two, Sheamus versus Gunther. And we're off to Wales is the first clash of the castle. Now, 2022 WWE actually offers a lot when it does come to matches, but Sheamus versus Gunther for the Intercontinental title is right there, because it is two big men slapping man meat, and in many ways, it's an all-timer. And even Dave Meltzer for the Rescue Observer gave it five stars, which he rarely does with WWE, and they don't even do that much here, but it's just how hard they hit each other, it's just the emotion, it's just the story, and it's the fact that Sheamus keeps getting back into this to the point he got me, I don't know what direction it was gonna go. There was also nothing flashy here, which is the complete opposite of WWE style. So that tied into the overall story we were trying to tell, which is, oh my gosh, maybe this is a new era for WWE, and maybe I'm interested again. We even made sure to wheel 
of like Imperium here as a threesome, which we'd never seen on the main roster. And by the time that Gunther had retained his intercontinental title, you just knew we were on the cusp of history. And now we can talk about it. Is he one of the greatest, if not the greatest intercontinental champion ever? The answer is yes. And it's down to bangers like this. It just goes to show. Sheamus, as I always tell you, is massively underrated. Number one, the Usos versus Roman Reigns and Solas are going. Now I was there at the O2 Arena in London for Money in the Bank 2023. And I thought this ruled. And a huge reason I wanted to put this there is thanks to the Bloodline, who of course have made the last two years in WWE so entertaining. And this was the first match where they had turned on each other and they were gonna fight. You'd also probably say this is the peak because go and listen to the crowd. I mean, after Roman and Solo have just beaten on Jimmy and Jay and beaten on Jimmy and Jay and all of a sudden the Usos start coming back. And again, I was one of these people. We all lost our minds because maybe we were gonna see the unthinkable and we did, which was Jay Uso splashing Roman and getting the one, two, three. And that was just something that never ever happened. You also had all these amazing near falls, one of which may be the best one ever, but it put your heart into the floor. And don't forget, it was performances like this that turned Jay Uso into main event. Jay Uso, and I will stand by this until the day I do die. Nobody thought this was possible back in 2019 or 2020. Another reason the bloodline was so damn good for WWE. And the final reason I wanted to put it at number one, or at least make sure to remind you to go and watch it again. This is way better than we gave it credit for. And at the time, people still loved it. That didn't really make any sense. But there you go, my friends, a bunch of matches for you to watch over the next few weeks if you do have the time. And of course, there's gonna be other options, suggestions too. So let me know in the comments below. Before you like the video, share the video and subscribe. Check the video on the screen as well to continue on your Simon Miller Watt culture adventure. Thank you very much for joining me for a very long afternoon, but I enjoyed it. It was nice having your company. See you soon.